You're watching In Technology, a video cast where you can get smarter about cybersecurity, sustainability, and technology. Here are your hosts, Tom Garrison and Camille Moorhart. We have two guests today. Our first is Jim Ducharme. He is a COO at Outseer. Jim is responsible for product strategy and leads the associated product management and engineering teams at Outseer. Our second guest is Armin Nigerian. Armin is a 15-year Silicon Valley veteran with deep experience leading the marketing functions for fast-growing fraud prevention, predictive analytics, and cybersecurity companies. So welcome to the podcast. So the first area that I want to spend some time on is the, the, the notion of this buy now, pay later trend that's going on in the market space. And and what sort of threats exist in that in that world? So maybe I'll just throw it open to both of you. But can you first just describe what is this buy now, pay later? And then we'll get to the threats here in a moment. Yeah, so you've probably seen, uh, you know, as you shop online, uh, buy now, pay later is just yet another way to pay when you when you go shopping. Uh, so in the past, you know, when you're checking out, you might see a credit card, uh, putting your credit card here. But now you see buy now, pay later, which allows you to take a purchase and put it on basically an installment plan, pay in three installments, nine installments, whatever it may be. So it's just a new way to pay. So we at Outseer look at this as, as yet another form of a, an emerging digital payment that is ripe for uh, fraudsters to take advantage of as yet another way to, to steal your money. And so, so that's what we spend our time looking at is, is what are the ways in which fraudsters can take advantage of these new digital payments like buy now, pay later to commit fraud. So, yeah, I'm aware of the buy now, pay later. I think most of us have seen that when we uh, per- make purchases. But I wonder from your perspective, obviously, you're thinking about cybercrime. Can you walk through the basics of where there is, uh, you know, various threats and what those are? So, Gus, I'll take this. Uh, there... There's risk and then there's threats. The inherent risk with the buy now, pay later model is inherently when you're offering this new form of credit that's unregulated today, uh, it exposes opportunities for for people that might not have the wherewithal to pay to actually take on this credit. And so there's inherent credit risk, sometimes referred to as first party fraud or friendly fraud, you know, where, you know, I as a consumer, I might not have a steady job but I have the opportunity to buy some items on effectively an installment plan. Doesn't affect my credit today. I might do it and lo and behold, six months later, I might not be in a position to pay. So there's that inherent credit risk that exists. In fact, just last week, Afterpay, which is the Australian-based buy now, pay later platform that was acquired by Square last year, announced a massive deficit, a massive shortfall due to unplanned credit risk that actually came to fruition. So that's one type of risk that exists in this in this you know this new payment instrument world called installment payments or buy now pay later. So for that one, the 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 risk is actually to the uh, vendors. The vendor wouldn't get paid. Is that correct? Is that the where the risk exists? So the the, the beauty of the model from a merchant perspective is they get paid instantly because oftentimes there's a third party buy now pay later provider behind the scenes that's effectively buying the transaction. From the merchants. So the merchants generally like this because they get paid, they reduce their risk out of the gate. They'll take a little bit of a hit because we're getting kind of the guaranteed payment up front. But the risk is being borne by typically the buy now, pay later platforms like Afterpay and Klarna and several others out there that, that are dominating the space. The fraud that we're starting to see orchestrated, the orchestrated fraud are, are really two flavors. One is your traditional account takeover fraud right? So I have an account as a consumer, I have an account, someone steals my credentials, they log into my Afterpay account, they begin executing transactions, uh, unbeknownst to me, effectively buying transactions using Klarna's, you know, installment payment plans. I don't discover this for a few months. So there's that type of fraud that exists. And it's very, very real. The other type of fraud we're seeing is synthetic identity fraud, where a new account is created, that borrows bits of data from maybe an authentic human, but bits of data that are kind of contrived to create this new identity, a synthetic identity, a person that doesn't really exist and establishes effectively credit with one of these buy now, pay later platforms and begins transacting and buying a whole bunch of goods and services 
and then all of a sudden disappears when the installment payments are due. The the perpetrators of of these um, these this fraud are they are they like nation state type people? Are are they I don't know you know teenagers or who who's doing this? This could be basically anybody from you know local teenagers to professional fraudsters that are creating a whole supply chain of, of basically stolen goods. We tend not to see this as sort of nation state actors committing this, but more uh, nefarious, typical identity thieves. And you know we see on the dark web with our with our fraud analysts all the time these these stores, these online shopping stores that you can buy goods and services from for you know 80, 90 percent off. And again, to Armand's point some of these goods may be obtained through you know, threat vectors of buy now, pay later, right? They've used buy now, pay later to get the merchandise, shove it through a supply chain, and, and ultimately they want to end up with the, with the money. Without obviously going into too many details, how do you prevent this sort of nefarious actor, whether it's the creating identities that aren't real people or, or you know, stealing legitimate people's information? How, how does a company like Outseer or other your competitors, how, how, do you, how do you solve that problem or help solve the problem? Our, our products for decades have been, have been designed around looking for transactional fraud. And we've seen you know, new types of identities born and new types of transactions happen. But essentially, we use information uh, about the transaction and about other, you know, our outside your global data network, about transactions that we see in, in the world to look for basically uh, a, a the level of trust or risk associated with a particular transaction. So when you talk about things like synthetic identities or even stealing somebody's identities, you know, is this Armin Nigerian, right? We want to do some level of verification that it's in, as him. Is he in a location that we typically see? Is it is it device centric? Is this his, his, his spending patterns, et cetera? The new twist with buy now, pay later, as Armin pointed out, is many times we're, you're shopping for the first time with one of these buy now, pay later instruments, right? As opposed to using your credit card where you have an established relationship with your bank. So you're almost establishing credit right then. And so that's where this sort of notion of synthetic identity or even just stolen identity comes in. So we have to do a level of identity verification, identity assurance to make sure it actually is Armin. And beyond just we have an existing relationship like you might with your bank, we actually have to make sure that this is the first time I'm meeting Armin. Is this actually Armin? And so our risk engine comes in and takes, takes into play hundreds of, of data points as part of the transaction and our ecosystem to do verification that, that this is indeed Armin and this is a legitimate transaction from Armin. I'll add to that, just say in, just in general, like not really speaking to outseer capabilities, but we live in a digital world. Decisions must be made in the moment. And, and so really the challenge is and the opportunity is these are real-time decisions, 100 milliseconds or less. Like, Tom, you press the buy button on your favorite shopping site. Within 100 milliseconds, behind the scenes is when this is happening. To Jim's point, it's risk-based decisioning. Now, the reality is 95% of all transactions are totally legitimate from authentic customers just wanting to buy their goods and services. And so we don't want to stand in the way of Tom wanting to get what he wants or, or Camille wanted to get what she wants, right? We want to treat you well. We don't want to step you up to a challenge question or subject you to you know, additional hurdles to get what you need to get done. However, 5% of the transaction are either suspect or outright fraud. And it's knowing which of those 5% are suspect or legitimate fraud and doing something about it in the moment. And, and therein lies science and risk decisioning in the moment. And, and you know, I'm, I'm oversimplifying it, but that's what's happening behind the scenes after you click the buy button or the pay button. Um, there's sophisticated commands and sophisticated algorithms working behind the scenes to thread bits of data together to make a call, to make a judgment call whether Tom should be trusted or the person purporting to be Camille should be trusted. Are there, I assume you're using algorithms, maybe you're using uh, machine learning models or artificial intelligence to kind of iterate <laughs> and keep up. Uh, by the same token, are you seeing, we'll just say the bad guys, you know, cr use AI and other sorts of algorithms to create the synthetic IDs, large numbers of them? And can you talk a little bit about, you know, that kind of back and forth and how that's working? 
So we do use artificial intelligence and machine learning because the fraudsters are always manipulating how they how they take advantage of fraud. And, you know, in particular, this is important because for those uh, financial institutions that don't use that and have more of a rigid policy based fraud detection model, for example, some banks may use if, if you're in the same geo, same region that you live in. And so Armin may be traveling. He's in New York. He's from California. They may look at it and go, hey, Armin's very far away from his home, it appears. That transaction seems suspect. Well, the fraudsters are on to these sort of static policy-based piece. So we have to really look at behavioral patterns and, and, and how that shifts over time. We see everything from fraudsters change the, the transaction value. So you know, rather than go steal the $3,000 TV, we'll go steal $109 pieces of goods because it flies under the radar. So by using artificial uh, intelligence and more importantly, machine learning, we can watch for these trends and the machine learning will actually tell us where the where where the oddness is coming in, where that pattern is shifting, and and we can adapt quickly to that. So we we've been talking about sort of identity fraud and and this this transaction fraud, but if we can move now over to brands, so companies that are out there, as well established companies, and using you know services around making sure people aren't impersonating them. Yeah, so there's an epidemic taking place with brands that are being impersonated for the purpose of achieving two outcomes. One, financial gain. We can talk about that. And then two, spreading misinformation. And any brand is subject to this type of attack. These attacks are often uh, very difficult to detect and can cause a lot of damage with the end consumer. Um, by either stealing credentials or stealing data or spreading information or stealing money. And they also negatively affect the brand and the reputation of that brand. And so we're increasingly seeing these types of attacks take place. They're vicious, they're quick hitting, they can cause a lot of damage, yet they can be stopped. And can you give an example? I don't know if there's one that's been in the news or something that, that would help our listeners sort of understand the, the damage or what, what an attack like this might look like. And if not, just make one up and, and sort of don't use a, a, a real company's name, but either one. Yeah, so a classic attack, it's, it's a classic phishing attack that let's just say you're, you're your favorite coffee, retail coffee shop, and you're part of the loyalty program and you might get an email saying, hey, you've got some points, add it to your account, go check them out, you know, f- you know special day today. So a, an innocent consumer receives that message they click through, they log into you know, their loyalty program account or what they think is their loyalty program account, and then the damage is done. Effectively, their credentials have just been stolen. But damage can be done. This type of attack that I just described happens all the time, and, and it can be quite damaging, again, to the consumer and to the brand itself. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And then, you know, so that's why you have to have a, a multi-pronged approach to how do you prevent this? How do you make it effective? So so let's say somebody is victim to that, right? That's why we put these controls uh, on the legitimate usage of these of these systems. So as Armin said, like the point system that you may be using or even your bank. Um, now that somebody's coming in with, with your credentials, is it actually you? And so that's where a lot of the machine learning you, is this your normal behavior? Is this when you usually access your account? Is this usually the behavior that you, that you do? So that provides some level of effective control around when somebody steals your credentials. So it's not like, you know, with these effective controls, if somebody just has your username and password, we can still think that that's, that's a, a suspect transaction. Um, but as we talked about before, you know, fraudsters are onto this, that look, sometimes just having somebody's username and password isn't enough because of these artificial intelligence, machine learning controls behind the scenes. So now what we actually see them doing is, is actually doing remote access. So they may call up and I may pretend to say, you know, hey, Camille, I'm, I'm Jim from your wealth management company and we think there's something going wrong with your computer. We wanna walk you through it to protect your account. Would you allow us to log into your computer and, and we'll walk you through how to fix this? And, and what's happening is now they're committing fraud from your home, from your device, using many times your fingertips to log into your account and they're, and they're diverting it that way or even just getting in enough to put malware on your account. So at least it looks like, again, what they're trying to do now is rather than just steal credentials, 
they're actually trying to impersonate the signal or the data that many of these fraud systems are using to understand, is this actually Camille, right? And, and that's, that's why the fraudsters are shifting tactics. And we always have to be ahead of, is this actually a, a legitimate transaction or not, right? Because they're always shifting. So in that case, multi-factor authentication doesn't help because I'm just going to go ahead and do that You're myself do and help the fraudster. Yeah, that's exactly right. Well, this is this is very fascinating. So the scary as heck, to be honest with you, because I can see how difficult it would be to protect against both of these kinds of attack. The the buy now pay later is a huge challenge, technical challenge as well as the uh, brand identity issues. So great topic, but before we let you go, we do have one more segment that we'd like to do on our podcast, which is called Fun Facts. And so um, I'll start maybe with Jim. Uh, do you have any cool fun fact that you'd like to share with our listeners? Yeah, well, I think this one's a little timely because I, uh, Elon Musk has been in the news lately, and, and I, I saw this a couple weeks ago, and it, it said, uh, if you want to appreciate how much money Elon Musk has, it says, if you were born in 80,000 BC, 80,000 BC, so over 82,000 years ago, and you saved $10,000 a day, you still would not have as much money as Elon Musk. So talk about goals. Uh, wow. That's, that's a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That is a lot. I've never heard that before. That's, that's cool. Uh, Armin, how about you? So I am thinking about vacations for this year and like exotic locales. And, you know, one place I've always wanted to visit was Easter Island. So I started researching Easter Island. We've all seen those big figureheads, those figures that have been carved out of stone, those mysterious figures. And so I started researching those. And it turns out, you know, what we see in the images in some cases is literally just the tip of the iceberg. There are some of those figures that have actually been determined to actually go down like 30 or more feet below the ground with full bodies. I don't think many people realize that. And it just adds to the mystery and the intrigue of how the heck were these things even created and, and you know, erected and moved to their locations? It's just, it, 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 it takes what made a mystery even more mysterious. Cool. Camille. Yeah, I enlisted some friends to help with fun facts. And unfortunately, this is more of a horrifying fact, but I'm going to read it anyway, because I think that people should be aware, at least. There were... Oregon black exclusion laws in effect starting in the late 1800s that actually made it illegal for black people to live in Oregon for more than two or three years. And they came off the books uh, in 1925, which seems shockingly late. And I guess the, the very final reference to them didn't come off the books until 2002. So oh. you can look it up for more information. Yikes. Wow. I didn't, I've never heard that. Wow. Uh, well, I'm going to go much uh, lighter in tone. The first McDonald's drive through was installed in a restaurant in Sierra Vista, Arizona, located near a local military base. The military rules forbade the soldiers from wearing their military uniforms in public, and they weren't going to go change to their civilian clothes just to go grab a burger. So the restaurant manager named David Rich came up with a solution. He cut a hole in the wall and allowed members of the military to, to pick up their orders without stepping out of their car. And the convenience and the simplicity of the idea quickly caught on. So that's who we have to thank, uh, David Rich. All right. Well, hey, uh, Jim and Armin, thank you so much for coming in. It was a, a topic we hadn't covered yet over all the episodes, and, and I think both Camille and I found it fascinating. So thanks for sharing. Never miss an episode of In Technology by following us here on YouTube or wherever you get your audio podcasts. The views and opinions expressed are those of the guests and author and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Intel Corporation. Intel Corporation.